Honorable members, when the last, when the house last rose, honorable mem member, note that if you leave this room, there will be, there will not be a quorum. Okay, one leaves and one. Okay, honorable members, the quest, the, when the house last rose, we were on the subject bills on the order paper. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the first reading of a bill shortly entitled the Airport Development Act. Airport Development. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of Standing Order 48-2 to allow this the Airport bill. Development Act bill. bill. Airport Development Bill. Sorry? Sorry. Airport Development Bill to go through its, um, the, its remaining stages. Honorable members, the question is that Standing Order 48 to be suspended in order to allow the Airport Development Bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for a second reading of a bill shortly entitled the Airport Development Bill. Madam Speaker, when I presented my budget address in 2017-2018, I informed you that my government had decided to embark upon exploring alternative financing arrangements for the development of the Hunora International Airport. With the context of the broader vision of a development for View Fort, this bill, the Airport Development Bill, provides for the development of the airport. It repeats, it repeals the Hunora International Airport Development Act number no. seven of 2015. This act was specific to facilitate a public private partnership between the government of St. Lucia and the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority and a concessionaire as proposed by the International Finance Corporation. The bill levies an airport development charge of US $35 on all travelers on the purchase of an airline ticket for the purpose of making payments for debt service requirements of a debt arrangement to implement airport facility improvements. Where a debt arrangement is entered into, the authority shall set up a lockbox account will, which will in, will account will, in which monies will be collected from the development charge are transferred. Madam Speaker, this bill proposes the establishment of an airport facility development fund, which consists of the development charge and the interest on the development charge that exceeds the debt service requirement of a debt arrangement. Madam Speaker, you may recall in February of 2011, the Airport Development Act Chapter 15.4 came into force, but was subsequently repealed in June of 2015, following a zeroing of the airport development charge in 2013. <coughs> Between February of 2011 and August of 2013, the fund had accumulated almost $50 million. Madam Speaker, much has been said about the taxes imposed on the airline tickets for travel in and out of St. Lucia. Permit me to inform this honorable house of the taxes that will be applicable with the proposed implementation of this airport development tax. The airport service charge, SLASPA, will be $12.60 US. The government of St. Lucia recurrent revenue of $10.50, solid waste $1.50, tourism marketing $10, and a sinking fund of $16.78. For the and the administration to collect to collector, which is an estimate of $1.62. So the total amount of the airport service charge will be $53. The airport development tax facility would be $35, and a security charge of $5, and a passenger facility fee 
of $5 for a total of $98. The highest tax payable will be $98. In other words, when all various tax types are considered, including what is proposed here today, the cumulative taxes will not exceed US $98. It means there will be no need to make adjustments to some of the taxes that are already in effect to achieve this. So Madam Speaker, as I indicated, we had already come to the House to pass um, this motion, this bill, um, to put on the $35 tax. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, exactly as indicated by the former Prime Minister and the representative from Viewfort South during that said presentation, that what we needed to do was to repeal the previous act imposed by the former government, which would have set up a vehicle for this public sector, private sector arrangement. So in repealing that, allows us now to take the $35 and put it back into this lockbox facility that, we're putting, that we've put in place. Um, we have been working with IATA, we've been working with the airlines, um, and we're hoping to have this new tax start on January 1st, Madam Speaker. And there's been much of an outcry as well, Madam Speaker, about the potential impact on our arrivals. Um, and while there was obviously some concern expressed by some of the airlines, um, we have seen that their numbers continue to grow from strength to strength. So we've already implemented part of this tax, the $58, which included the 25 previously, and now the additional amount has already been implemented. Um, and now all we're doing is going to now start the $35. In terms of competitiveness, Madam Speaker, most of the countries have taxes in excess of $85. In fact, some countries have it in excess of $115. The recent airport in Bermuda, which is just being done, raise their tax to $100. So we believe that we're in line with all the other destinations, um, and we believe that putting this $35 in a lockbox at this time, Madam Speaker, will go a long ways in able to secure now the implementation on the construction of a new airport. Honorable members, the question is that the Airport Development Bill be read a second time. Honorable Member for Castries South. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this is a very troubling bill. It is probably in many ways, Madam Speaker, almost insulting to the people of St. Lucia and the Parliament of St. Lucia for this bill to come before this honorable parliament at this time. Madam Speaker, there's a lot that can be said about the proposed airport development. And I'm sure, Madam Speaker, for the next few hours, a lot will be said. And I have a lot of sympathy for you, Madam Speaker, for the tribulations that you will go through in the coming hours, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, is a consequence of not have, having a deputy speaker in this chamber that you will have to suffer the consequences. But I do express my sympathies to you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in the previous United Workers' Party government, headed by the member for Castries North, there was a proposal and there were plans to redevelop the airport, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it never came to fruition. And at that time, Madam Speaker, there was a lot of talk as to why it did not come to fruition. There was talk of corruption. There was talk of attempts to bribe public officials. And Madam Speaker, it is a narrative that continued for many years after. And in this honorable house, Madam Speaker, I've heard a frequent and repeated refrain about Jufali, Jufali, Jufali. And Madam Speaker, I took to reminding a particular member of this house, the member for Castro Southeast, that I would not answer him unless he answered 
a popular talk show host who had made some very startling revelations or accusations. But Madam Speaker, let's put that aside for now, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> I want to first of all deal with the concept behind this bill. Because when the then Prime Minister Stevenson King did not sign the ANM agreement, if we go in accordance with what we've heard espoused in public by Richard Frederick and never denied by the member for Cashy South East, the Labour Party, when it came into government, decided to choose a different route. The Labour Party argued that rather than the government of Central taking a loan for 150 million US dollars, or thereabout, Madam Speaker, which is 400 million EC dollars. The Labour Party argued that was too heavy a burden to be borne by the people of St. Lucia, to increase our debt by 400 million dollars. That instead, it would choose a different route, a different concept. And may I add, Madam Speaker, to choose a route and a concept which was now becoming the acceptable way of building airports and managing airports. The Labour Party did its research and contacted the World Bank to assist in the way forward. And the leader of the opposition, when he speaks later on, will go into greater detail as he was at the center of it. I was still somebody outside the margins of parliament. But Madam Speaker, through the IFC, and you must note, Madam Speaker, the IFC as a private sector arm of the World Bank is trusted, there is confidence in it, there is no issue of corruption, there is no issue of bribery, there is transparency, there is accountability. The St. Lucia government engaged the IFC and went through a very long, detailed process to come up with a model and a financial arrangement and a selection process that would have the best deal for St. Lucia. The best deal for St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister and other officials, the Minister of Economic Development from Kansas Office, they all go to World Bank meetings. There is confidence in the World Bank. We believe in the World Bank. We take loans from the World Bank. We have a relationship with the IFC. We believe in the institutions of the World Bank. We have no doubt in our mind that there is no corruption, there is no bribery, there is transparency, there is accountability in the functioning and the operations of the World Bank. It is that institution created together with the IMF to oversee the global economy. That is the stature and the respectability of the World Bank and by extension the IFC. So when the government of St. Lucia engaged the World Bank and started a process, it was done with an institution that nobody had any doubts about its credibility, its integrity, and what it stood for. And after many years, Madam Speaker, of research, of discussion, it was agreed with the IMF, with the IFC, on a particular arrangement that would see an airport being built in St. Lucia that would not cause St. Lucian taxpayers, and most importantly, Madam Speaker, the future generations to have to carry the burden of a loan of about 150 million US. That's 400 million EC, Madam Speaker. That there was an arrangement with the World Bank, Madam Speaker, by extension through the, the IFC, to provide us with a modern airport, Madam Speaker. And we would not have to worry about paying back any loan, Madam Speaker. So we had an arrangement for financing and for managing of the airports. 
where the IFC would manage a selection process and come up with a preferred company that would do the, the construction and manage, Madam Speaker. We would not have to pay a cent. And Madam Speaker, if I'm wrong, members on the other side can correct me. Madam Speaker, think about it. This country would not have to borrow 150 million US dollars. And when the leader of the opposition speaks, he will give more details. We were actually going to earn money, Madam Speaker. So not only would we not have to take a loan and repay it, but we would also be earning money, Madam Speaker. So again, Madam Speaker, the leader of the opposition will give you verse and chapter. And the question has to be asked, Madam Speaker, why in such a context would we come back full circle, reject the World Bank and the IFC, have to pay a fine to the IFC for abandoning the process? Because you would appreciate, Madam Speaker, there are consultants involved, there are expenses involved for them to be able to have been engaged with St. Lucia. We would reverse that and we'd go back to an old concept where St. Lucia would have to borrow 150 million US dollars, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, that troubles me. It really, really troubles me. Because, Madam Speaker, this model is what is becoming the acceptable model in the world. Gatwick Airport, Madam Speaker, I know you're familiar with it, is not run by the government of the United Kingdom, Madam Speaker. Heathrow Airport is not run by the government of the United Kingdom, Madam Speaker. There's private sector involvement. Dubai International Airport, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, only recently Montego Bay was rated the best airport in the Caribbean. Who runs Montego Bay, Madam Speaker? Who runs it? It is not the government authorities or statutory body in Jamaica, Madam Speaker. This is becoming the model, Madam Speaker. So there we are, working with one of the most respected institutions in the world, outlining a process that globally has regard and respect because of the absence of any corruption, any bribery, transparency, openness. And we are abandoning that model, Madam Speaker, and we're going back to a model where we have to borrow 150 million US dollars, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, you can understand why I'm troubled by this. Now, I know members on the other side, well, not all, some members or couple, said that our level of comprehension is rather low. You know, and one member even asked me, what have I ever done to have any success in life? Well, I know I did. Uh, well, Madam Speaker, I'm not exactly consider myself the dumbest guy on the block, but I am failing to see the logic in it, Madam Speaker. It troubles me. Why would you abandon the World Bank, the IFC? You would abandon the model that is now becoming the prevailing model in the world. Why would you abandon a situation where you don't have to take a loan of $400 million? Why would you abandon that, Madam Speaker? Why? How do I explain that to my daughters, Madam Speaker? How do I explain that to the young people in, in Fua Show, Madam Speaker? You know, in Monkey Tong, in, in Marigo, how do I explain to them that this government see a compelling logic in abandoning the World Bank and the IFC, abandoning a model that is working globally, abandoning a situation where they don't have to borrow a cent to want to borrow $400 million and in debt this country, Madam Speaker. I, I, I'm lost, Madam Speaker. I'm lost, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, it becomes even more disturbing, Madam Speaker, because I need to go back to how I started, Madam Speaker, because we would have heard, Madam Speaker, repeated often, Madam Speaker, that the reason why the project did not get started, Madam Speaker, is because it was not signed by the then Prime Minister. And he has a chance today, Madam Speaker, the member for Cassius North, Madam Speaker, has a chance today to probably speak on the issue. Well, not to probably speak. He has a chance to speak on the issue. 
and see whether or not a lot of the allegations made were true. Because we've heard the allegations over and over. Now, Madam Speaker, when people say things about you that are damaging, libelous, slander, whatever it is, you have recourse, Madam Speaker. You have recourse. But there's never been any public denial, not by the, Katsu, the member of Katsu's North, because he's not really been accused of any wrongdoing. But the member for Castro South East has been accused over and over, Madam Speaker, over this very project which the Labour Party, when it came into government, abandoned. He's never denied it, and today he has a chance to deny it, Madam Speaker. Because, Madam Speaker, if we're going back to a model, we're going back to a project that was tainted, Madam Speaker, it makes it even more damaging and disturbing to the people of St. Lucia, Madam Speaker. Because not only are you abandoning a project that was started by the Labour Party that compels you to continue with it, but you are defying all logic and you're going back to an old model. But that old model was tainted, Madam Speaker. It was tainted because there were enough talk in public about what happened then and why it was not signed. Don't the people of St. Lucia need to know whether there's any truth in this, Madam Speaker, if those allegations are being made boldly, brazenly, on public television, Thursday after Thursday after Thursday, and nobody is denying it, Madam Speaker, and you're asking us to go back into this same kind of arrangement where the government is taking a loan to choose a co somebody, a contractor, to build the airport, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, I rise to the point of order, um, Standing Order 35-5. Um, the member for Castries South, I would like to posit, Madam Speaker, is clearly imputing improper motive. Um, Madam Speaker, while he is using the word allegation, I find it very irresponsible, Madam Speaker, and disingenuous to actually insinuate that another member of this honorable house, Madam Speaker, has done something fraudulent. And Madam Speaker, I don't think that, uh, that this is, is proper. What's the improper motive? Madam Speaker, he's constantly suggesting that another member of the House um, has, has done something fraudulent um, and is claiming that he mentioned words like bribes. He mentioned, Madam Speaker, if he cannot substantiate the allegations, um, then they need to remain where they are as rumors. And I think that we ought to be responsible in the House. And when it comes to um, an individual's reputation, I don't think it is proper to keep uh, strongly insinuating that something wrong was done. He went even to suggest that uh, the former prime minister uh, refused to sign a document in, the, in, a, in uh, the name of a contractor. Madam Speaker, I think that this is improper. Unless he can substantiate the point, then... Honorable Minister, I think the Honorable Member, with all due respect, is staying clear on the periphery <laughs> of, of where he is going. He's claiming, uh, I, I, I am listening, and he's staying clear on the periphery, on the borders of cautiously by his words. Member for Castries is Southeast. Um, he has mentioned bribe. He's, he's said fraud. He is also mentioned um, clearly in one specific issue that the former Prime Minister and member for Castries North has refused to sign a contract awarded to the airport to a specific company. And I'm saying, Madam Speaker, if he's going to go that way, then he needs to provide the evidence. 
Can I proceed, Madam Speaker? We need to roll. Please do. Your allegation of, of um, imputing improper motive, Honorable Minister, is not substantiated and is not being proved. Because the Honorable Member is making reference and repeatedly making reference to questions being asked of the Honorable, the Honorable Minister and Member for Cassius South East. Yet, what he seems to be asking is why has he not refuted allegations being made about him? I, I, I am paying close attention to it. Thank you. Please proceed, Honorable Member. For Madam Speaker, so much has been said about West Indies cricket, about Joe Farley, Madam Speaker. And then today, because I make a simple statement that there's been so much said on public television every Thursday by a particular talk show host about the member for Cassius North, to a lesser extent, and the member for Cassius Office, but the member from Cassius Office, not a member for Cassius North, has yes. chosen to deny it. And I'm said it creates, Madam Speaker, a lack of confidence among citizens, Madam Speaker, when they hear such serious allegations being made and nothing being done about it. But Madam Speaker, the member for Ancillary Canaries asked me to provide evidence of why I believe, why I believe that there may have been conduct that's not acceptable, Madam Speaker, either in accordance with our laws or what is expected of a public official, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, with your permission, can I make, as a document of a house, the documents that have been circulating, including the letter from the Attorney General of St. Lucia to the U.S. Department of Justice. Madam Speaker, I was asked by the Honorable Member to provide evidence as to why I may have believed that something happened. And I would like your permission, Madam Speaker, because I want to read from it, Madam Speaker, to indicate, Madam Speaker, why, Madam Speaker, there is reason to believe that something untold happened Listen to me carefully, Madam Speaker. There is reason to believe that something untold. Madam Speaker, let me tell you something. I, I need to say something, Madam Speaker. I am not gloating over any situation that any member find themselves in, Madam Speaker. I am not doing that. I am not doing that. I, am, I have been accused, Madam Speaker, and that particular member and other members have taken particular glee at spreading rumors and saying things, Madam Speaker. But, Madam Speaker, I have always stayed focused, Madam Speaker. I am not taking any pleasure or delight, Madam Speaker, but this is the Honorable House, Madam Speaker. And I was not going to go down that road, Madam Speaker. I was going to just argue and debate along the margins, like you said, Madam Speaker. I was going to remain along the periphery of the issue, Madam Speaker. But the Honorable Member from Ansley Canaries, Madam Speaker, he has opened the door. And he has asked me for evidence, Madam Speaker, as to why I would believe that the Honorable Member may not have acted properly. Madam Speaker, I want to read from the documents that are before Honorable, me. Honorable Member for Castries South. The Honorable Minister with Responsibility for Tourism has asked you for evidence you said. Hear it. For the first time I'm hearing today, about documents being circulated in social media. Documents circulating in social media, I want to posit, does not lead to the veracity, okay? The veracity of an allegation, and that depends on it's not just a matter widely, uh, a document widely circulated. It can be, because once it gets on social media, it will be widely circulated. And it can be circulated to 20 million people. That does not mean that the document is true as to its content. So for you to say you're producing it as evidence cannot hold. You may say there is a document circulating in social media 
or wherever been widely circulated and that you may ask questions about. However, whether that document, the authenticity of that document and the veracity of that document cannot be used to determine or to say that it is in its nature true. I want to make that point clear. Madam Speaker, you refer to documents on social media. I actually got it in a file, Madam Speaker. I didn't get it on social media. But notwithstanding that, Madam Speaker, notwithstanding, <laughs> Madam Speaker, I got it in a file, Madam Speaker, not on social media. But Madam Speaker, listen, listen to the, let's, let, let's get it clear. He asked me for evidence of why I seem to be implying what I was implying. And I'm going to provide Speaker, the Madam evidence. Madam Speaker, I rise in the point of order. Madam Speaker, the 35-5. Uh, no, no. What's that standing point order? order 30, point of order, Madam Speaker, 35-2. Uh, Madam Speaker. No, it's not so. Yeah. 35-2, Madam Speaker. Yeah. No, it's not 35-2. 34? 34-A, sorry, Madam Speaker. 34-A. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member from Castry South clearly said the document was circulated online. Clearly said it. He said the document being circulated. So he's got to make up his mind. It's either that he, brought, he got the document from the U.S. State Department, as he would like us to believe, or he got it on Wikipedia, as he would normally get all of his information. So please, make up your mind, Honorable Member. You have to come with sol a solid source that we can accept. Honorable Member for Ancillary Canaries, your point is made, okay? So... I'm saying, Honorable Member for Castro South, I have made my point on the document. Now, I think we need to get serious as to, and to then lift up a file and tell me you got it in a file. I mean, please, let's, let's move on, please. But Madam Speaker, I'm not debating the authenticity of the document, sir. I was asked to provide evidence of why I was making certain statements, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, if so the... Yeah, don't. With respect to the back and forth, we're playing with words there, and hear the words. I was asked to provide evidence as to why I believe. Yes, Madam. <laughs> Madam Speaker, when the Honorable Member would ask, suggest. Honorable I, Member for Castro South, please proceed. You know, Madam Speaker, you know, you would suggest I get my information on Wikipedia. Madam Speaker, you know. Madam Speaker, if the Honorable Member has any doubts as to the authenticity of the document, the Attorney General of St. Lucia is right here. Who sits in cabinet with you, but he's right here. You can ask him, Honorable Madam Speaker, through you to Honorable Member, whether or not as Attorney General he can establish from the files of the Attorney General Chambers that such a letter exists. The letter I'm going to read from. But he's the Attorney General, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, I let can, me I continue can, Speaker, to read. Madam Speaker, a point, a point of order. On, on elucidation. No, I'm not. I'm not okay. Honorable Prime the Minister. Fa the fact is, there is no such files in the Attorney General's office, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, you the Attorney General? No. Okay. So, Madam Speaker, let me read from the letter that the Attorney General, at the time in the year, I'm reading, it's up to the individuals in question to deny whether the accusations may they ever happen, Madam Speaker. And, Madam Speaker, I want to ask that those documents. I I have, I have ordered in this honorable house that if members are going to read from a document, it must be circulated to members. If members Madam are going to refer to a document. Madam Speaker, we've been down this road before, Madam Speaker, in which you, re you make reference to Erskine's. And Erskine says that documents where you cannot determine where they came from that all you can do is cite them. Yes. But citing, citing is not placing them in the house. Citing. So you can make reference to it, but, and you can cite it, but you cannot make it a document in this house. It, because it, we do not know the authenticity of those doc documents, Madam Speaker.
Well, that's the last time I will yield to you then. If you cannot get it right, then you are out. Erskine, okay. Erskine yeah. page no, you I won't four. yield to you any amount of respect. Madam. Erskine May Parliamentary Practice, 24th edition, published by LexisNexis, page 447. There is no rule to prevent members not connected with the government from citing documents in their possession, both public and private, which are not before the House, even though the House will not be able to form a correct judgment from partial extracts. That was widely circulated before, um, a few months ago. Okay, So you can cite the document. There is nothing preventing the cited document from making the rounds or being given to members also. So, Madam Speaker, am I hearing in this honorable chamber that the Prime Minister is saying that the government of St. Lucia did not write to the U.S. government? Because I am saying that it is very easy to establish whether or not the government of St. Lucia wrote to the U.S. government. I'm saying it's very easy to establish that. And the Prime Minister is saying that he can establish that there is no record, there is no record of this letter in the Attorney General Chambers. Now the Attorney General is here, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, can I proceed to cite since I cannot make a document at the House, Madam Speaker? Well, I have given your staff to, to make, I just happen to have had a backup copy in case what happened now. Circulate, happened. please. So. When it is here. Copy, do you want to take a recess until the copy is added? To move to another point and come back. Okay, Madam Speaker. I will move to another point and come back. But Madam Speaker, so let me move, and I'll come back to this point, to the substance of the bill, Madam Speaker. The substance of the bill, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I need you to help me understand something about the bill. And I'm glad that the Attorney General is here. Because the bill says, Madam Speaker, that it comes into effect, Madam Speaker, on the first day of January 2018. On the first day of January 2018. And I want you to follow me because it might be a very simple explanation that the AG can provide, Madam Speaker, when we go into committee stage, Madam Speaker. It comes into effect the first of January 2018. And listen to this, Madam Speaker. Section 11, Madam Speaker. The payment of development charge to the authority. A collector shall pay the development charge into and place the development charge to the credit of an account at a bank approved by the authority with the consent of the minister. It is assumed, Madam Speaker, that when the monies are collected from the airport development tax, it will be Pull it in an account at a bank approved by the authority with the consent of the minister. Debt service, 12, 12 one says, subject to this section, the development charge is for the purpose of making payments for the debt service requirement of a debt arrangement to implement airport facility improvement projects. So the money that's going to be put into the account, once this comes into effect on the 1st of January, that money goes into an account and is used to make payments for the debt service requirement. So the money goes into this account from the 1st of January and it will be used to make payments. 12.2 says, the authority may enter into a debt arrangement for the purpose of carrying out airport development projects on terms mutually agreed between the authority and the lender. So it says the money will go into an account from the 1st of January it will be used to pay the debt service, debt service arrangements, and it says the authority can go into such an arrangement. But then it goes on. Where a debt service arrangement is entered to under subsection 2, the authority shall set up a lockbox account into which money is collected from the development charge are transferred. Is 12 free suggesting that it is only when the debt service arrangement is entered into that that account can be set up? And therefore, only then monies can be collected. And it probably explains why 
under the previous Labour Party, Dr. Anthony had stopped the collection of the money. And Dr. Anthony, the member for, for Viewford South, had argued that you could not go about collecting monies if work had not started and there was no arrangement for the airport to be built. That you could not be charging people a tax for debt servicing for airport reconstruction when there was no debt service agreement in place and there was no reconstruction taking place. Pardon? Dredging what? I'm talking about the airport redevelopment. I don't know, but I'm telling you I don't know. I'm talking about this. Huh? I, you, I can only talk about what I know. According to the member from Answer Canary, is, is Wikipedia I get my information from? That's from Wikipedia, Madam Speaker. I, what I want, you, you could raise all your other issues. And even if it had been done that was wrong, if it is wrong, then we should correct it now. You understand? It may have been done by either party and it was wrong. But if it has been done wrong now and we can correct it, let's correct it. Let's correct it. So don't tell me it may have been done before and it was wrong. So, Madam Speaker, I just need an explanation. Is this suggesting that that lockbox account can only be set up when a debt service agreement and arrangement has been entered into? And I would want to ask the question. And, Madam Speaker, it might be a very simple answer. I'm not a lawyer. Unlike some people, I don't pretend that I know, you know how you draft those things. I only apply common sense understanding to it. But it seems to suggest that it is only at that point, and therefore, for it to be into effect on January 1st, 2018, as against what Section 12.3 says. I raise the question and I ask for some clarification, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I then move to 23 regulations, Madam Speaker. Because the Prime Minister earlier today, and I think the member for South Southeast, made a hue and cry about regulations for CIP and it did not come into this honorable house. I'm sure you recall that, Madam Speaker. And it has been said over and over by the Prime Minister that the regulations never came to the House for approval. And I ask the question, Madam Speaker, will regulations for the management of this fund come to Parliament for approval? You, 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 yes, you are promising that it will. Because, Madam Speaker, if it comes into effect on January the 1st, again, does it, Madam Speaker, you're a lawyer and the Attorney General is there, I assume it can come into effect without regulations being approved? Is that? That's not what I'm asking, Honorable Prime Minister. <laughs> I, 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 we, I, we talk about regulations, Madam Speaker, because you, you've given the promise that the regu regulations will come before this House before the act come into operation. And you know why it has to come before, Madam Speaker? Because if monies have been collected from January 1st, and I posit the view, and I, and, I, and I temper it by saying I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal draftsman, this is my common sense understanding of it, that you cannot start collecting fees and putting it in an account until you have a debt service arrangement in place, from my common sense reading of this. The regulations will say how that account will be set up, who are the signatories of it, what the monies will be used for, where the account will be established, and how that account will be administered, will be audited, Madam Speaker. The regulations will say that. So who are the people who are going to sign for the, the payments and the, the, the disbursements of monies from that account? Who are the people? And remember, we're saying all of that in the context of an arrangement that existed before that is heavily tainted, Madam Speaker. Heavily tainted. I'm remaining on the periphery, Madam Speaker. It's heavily tainted. Who, Madam Speaker, are the put where will this account be set up? Will it be set up in Dubai? In Jersey? Where is it going to be set up, Madam Speaker? Because you're talking about 150 million US dollars, Madam Speaker. Under what conditions, Madam Speaker, will monies be disbursed from it, Madam Speaker? There are a lot of issues that have to be dealt with in the regulations, Madam Speaker. And for all the criticism that was made, that were made, Madam Speaker, about regulations and regulations, and you all had regulations that didn't come to Parliament, will the regulations come to, be, to Parliament to be debated, Madam Speaker? And that's important, as I said, for a process that has been tainted, Madam Speaker. Then, Madam Speaker, 
the schedule two speaks of the travelers that are exempted from the payment of the development charge, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, I know there have to be exemptions, and some people will be exempted. But why are some included there? But the young people that will represent St. Lucia by going and play football overseas, cricket overseas, why are they not exempted, Madam Speaker? But, Madam Speaker, exempted... Ex D? D says... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, honorable member. No need to get too hyper. Hold on, honorable member. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You have to have the stamina for this. Hold on. It's going to be a long night. It's going to be a whole long night. Hear hey what D says, Madam Speaker. A person signified by a minister or permanent secretary of a ministry to be traveling on the business of government. Now, Madam Speaker, if a technical officer goes to a meeting, that's the business of government. If a permanent secretary goes overseas, Madam Speaker, are you now saying to me that a youth club going to St. Vincent is on the business of government? Is that what we're saying? Is that what you're saying, Honorable Member? That's what you're saying. Madam Speaker, if that's what it is meant to be there, I would prefer we have more specific language. Because when the young people traveling for sports, a youth group traveling, and they are told they're not going on the business of government, Madam Speaker, because do you know, Madam Speaker, there are sports persons in this country who cannot get time off to go and represent Senator overseas? During my time, that could never happen, Madam Speaker, during my time. No sports person chosen to represent Senator could ever be denied. Madam Speaker, look one. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I don't know if memory serves you right. Remember Brian Stevens, a cricketer? He used to work at the bank, Scotia Bank, and he was denied. I'm sure the member from Castro is not going to remember that. We stood up as youth leaders and cried that that must not happen in St. Lucia, where a young man cannot leave St. Lucia to go and represent the country in sports. And the member from Grosley, I know he has a lot of sympathy for that, and he will support me to amend the schedule to include persons traveling to represent St. Lucia through sports or youth groups, Madam Speaker, because there is an inclusion, Madam Speaker, listen to it. A person signified by a minister to be guest of the government is exempted. So all a minister has to say is that that person is a guest of the government and they're exempted from paying the airport development charge. But a young person going to represent St. Lucia is not included in here, Madam Speaker. You want specificity, yes. Greater specificity. So, Madam Speaker, I ask that this be revised and the list be made to include some of the persons who bear the burden of representing St. Lucia. And Madam Speaker, I'm hoping, I was hoping by now I could come back to the point which I started on, but has not, for some reason, the documents have not returned. But Madam Speaker, the documents, and I'm not going to cite them directly, but I'll speak to them, Madam Speaker. Because in the documents that have been printed for circulation, there is a letter, Madam Speaker, from the Attorney General Chambers of St. Lucia to the United States government asking for assistance and making a claim that there are two persons of interest for committing specific crimes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, that is very serious. Two persons identified, <coughs> Honorable Guy Joseph and a gentleman by the name of, um, what's it, a censor? I'm not familiar with all the details, Madam Speaker. That, that is included there. A request from the government of St. Lucia to the United States Justice Department, Madam Speaker. But that is very serious. And shouldn't the government issue a clear statement on this, Madam Speaker, to either deny that there's any authenticity to this letter, Madam Speaker, or to give an explanation and to say, look, everybody is innocent until proven guilty, and therefore the honorable member, let us see how this unfolds. But then there's a second letter, Madam Speaker, from the U.S. Department of Justice saying that they have reviewed the request on the dossier and they believe there is probable cause. I may have read it wrong, Madam Speaker, but that's my understanding. So when the member for Ancillary Canaries asked me, where is the evidence for you to be saying some of the things that you say you believe? That's the evidence. And Madam Speaker, I was not going to go down that road, you know. I was, I was going to stay on the periphery. But he has pushed me over that line, Madam Speaker. Pushed me over that line. And then, Madam Speaker, there is a third letter, Madam Speaker, 
Now, you may not be an honorable person, but trust me, I can speak about the issues without sharing any documents, Madam Speaker. I could speak about the issues without sharing it. I was not going to share it. I was going to speak about the overall picture, Madam Speaker. And there's a third letter, Madam Speaker, a third document that's filed in the courts, Southern Florida, Madam Speaker, appointing a commissioner to obtain the evidence, Madam Speaker. Now, Madam, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm standing on a point of order, 35-5. The member has chosen to mention my name, to call me by name, citing some document that he is speaking about that we have no knowledge of the authenticity of this document. Madam Speaker, I'm not among those who make an issue about these things. I can object. I have chosen to place on record that the member is saying things that is imparting improper motive to me. But that's not the issue for me, Madam Speaker. The issue is when I stand up to speak and I am free to cite anything that I want, whether it be my thinking, whether it be my reasoning, whether it be my interpretation, because he said he doesn't care if that's what it is saying. That is his understanding. And Madam Speaker, we are setting a very bad precedent in this house on allowing members to impart such, he knows somebody is innocent until proven guilty. An investigation, if there's an investigation, there's an investigation. Are we drawing a conclusion? And is he saying that it's in the court? And if he's saying it is in the court, then is it appropriate to debate it in the parliament when other people whose matters are before the court are being told that the matters cannot be debated and discussed? So, Madam Speaker... I'm placing this on record, not because I'm concerned about allegations or what is said, but that the record can reflect what has happened and what is transpiring in this honorable house. That when I tried to speak on certain subjects in the past, I was told it's sub judice, it's before the court. So you're saying it's before the court. It's all your interpretation. It is all what you suppose it to be. And you can just stand in the Honorable Parliament of St. Lucia and make all your allegations. So, Madam Speaker, I am placing this on the record and I'm saying that what the member for Castry South is doing is imparting, imputing improper motive and that he should refrain and withdraw the statements that includes my name. Madam Speaker, Honourable Member for Castry South, your whole debate or discussion, your presentation, seems to be centred around an honourable member of this house. Now, under 35.5, no member shall impute impure, no member shall impute improper motives to any other member of either chamber of the house and two, no member shall refer to any other member by name. You referred, you, now, and members generally note that as well, 35-6, no member shall refer to any other member by name. Now. Your entire presentation 
is centered it would appear on one subject. Can I finish? I'm, I'm speaking. <laughs> and I wish to say generally, it is, it is really amazing how members generally are in this house and fly all manners of accusation against each other. All, mem all manner of accusations against each other. And, and when it suits them, they smile, they clap, they cheer, they take it for jest, and laugh it away and say it is Pekong. Where do we draw the line regarding the Pekongs in the house? Where do we draw the line with respect to Pekong? Where do we draw the line? And I have said it before. It has gotten out of control and it is a back and forth constantly of saying that when that one said that and when that one said that and when that one said that, it is... Where is the line going to be drawn? Where is that line going to be drawn? And honorable members do not realize they make it so difficult now to navigate, for me to navigate, because it's, it's the, the lines, the, the, there is no clear cut line. It has become problematic. It has. It has become problematic. And I will call again. Having regard to the rules of the standing order which binds you all in this house, please stay within it and have respect one for the other. In what we say, and how we say what we say. Madam Speaker, I believe you were. Madam it. Speaker, I'm standing on the point of order 35.5. I requested that the statements that the, the member for Castries South made referring to me be withdrawn, be struck off from the record, because, Madam Speaker, I don't know, I don't know that a member has a right to come to this honorable house and say if he reads something, that is how he interprets it, and then imparts imputes improper motive to say that there was some deal that went down. Madam Speaker, people can ask questions. People can make statements. But to in, impute improper motive in this manner, the member has been on the case of statement made by talk show host. I don't listen to talk show. So I wouldn't know what statements are made. And I'm not interested in statements that are made. People have to be able to substantiate in this honorable house. And if this house has come to the point where anything I hear out there, I can bring it up. I can pull up my phone now, Madam Speaker, and I can read a number of statements people have sent to me to respond to the member for Castries South. And I can read them. But, Madam Speaker, that is not what the debate of the House is about. The debate of the House must be substantiated. And when the accusations are made, if I ever stand on my feet, Madam Speaker, and I make a statement, and I am directed to prove what I'm saying, or I'm challenged, 
If I cannot, I withdraw the statement, I apologize, and I move on. When I make statements, Madam Speaker, if I'm sitting here, I may send something across to a member. But when I'm on my feet, ask them how many times they have challenged me to prove what I am saying is that. So, Madam Speaker, my point of order stands that the member for Castry South cannot impart, impute improper motive in this manner, calling my name and saying that is how he interpreted it and it be allowed to go down in the records. Because once it's there, after today, it cannot be removed. So it must be dealt with now and when he can substantiate his source of information, then there can be other debates that he can come in and say, this is what it is. But Madam Speaker, I think I have that right that every other parliamentarian in this honorable house has to be given the opportunity at the appropriate time when there is proper information to deal with the matters that are being raised. Honorable Minister for um, Economic Planning, um, I wish to respond to you accordingly and I wish to note also Honorable Member for Castries South. The Honorable Member has cited that you impute improper motives to him regarding what you have said and he wants a withdrawal. And I'm going to ask you to withdraw statements made imputing improper motives as regards and also there was a point made earlier by him that you made reference to um, something in the Florida, South Florida courts or something. If it is in the South Florida courts or whatever that we have no knowledge about um, and if it is in the courts, it is sub judice. Now, the member is saying that he does not know anything about um, matters being in the Florida courts against him. Okay? Now, um, your, your assertions, your allegations, I mean, these are, these are not just, um, these are not just mere pecong, but I'm sure you would understand that this goes serious to, to, um, to one's integrity and, 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 um, a member's standing. So I really think it is, you're, you're going down a thin line and an improper and, and a line that I will not allow unless, unless you can prove what it is you are saying. And it cannot be that this is what you believe it cannot be this is what you believe or this is what is reasonably held by yourself um, regarding those very serious allegations. Okay, Madam Speaker, just help me out. Help me out. What are the comments that I said impute? What are the comments that impute in improper motives? Can you just say what? The speaker ruled, she asked me, but I don't, what comments, Madam Speaker? Just help me out. Let, let's, let's forget the noise for now, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, what did I say, and the honorable member from Castle South is can assist me. What statements did I make that are imputing improper motives? Let, let, let's, let me understand exactly what it is that I'm asking. Truth be told, I would like the honorable member for Castle South East to actually um, give clarity and be be and and be and be specific as to what what were the statements made that 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 um, fell foul of um, of um, standing order 45.5. Let's yeah, it's late. Let's deal with it specifically. Madam Speaker, the member from the time he started, and as you indicated. He said he was walking the borderline, or you said he was walking 
borderline. The member for ancillary canneries raised a couple objections. Don't worry about opening the door. We don't need the door open. The member for Castry South has been going down the road of, he made reference to what a talk show host has been saying. He's, he's made reference. He's made, I will tell you what other talk show hosts say in time, and I will tell you what's on my phone in time. Further, Madam Speaker, the member has further indicated that there are matters in a court in Florida. And then he cited my name and another individual's name, imputing that there is some fraudulent activity that has taken place and it's in the process of investigation and it is before the court. Now, Madam Speaker, if that is not imputing improper motive to a fellow member of the House, then I don't know what is. So I don't know whether the member wants us to replay the tape of what he said to delete what needs to be deleted. But, Madam Speaker, the entire last five minutes of the member's presentation has been in relation... Now, I would not say anything if he had not called my name. But from the time he said, Guy Joseph, everything that preceded that and everything that came after that imputes improper motive to Guy Joseph for something. And Madam Speaker, the most striking thing about what he said is he read a letter. And then that is his inter... He's not sure that's what the letter is saying. But that is his interpretation. That is how he understands it. Madam Speaker, that all of these statements needs to be withdrawn. So, so, Madam Speaker, let's listen to this. So this is becoming almost like a circus, Madam Speaker. I said, Madam Speaker, that the first document, and we had in an exchange, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I, I said, Madam Speaker, that the first document was a letter from the St. Lucia Attorney General to the U.S. Department of Justice. This, let, let's follow it and tell me, Madam Speaker, where I am imputing improper motives. Because, Madam Speaker, you are a lawyer and you know what it is to impute improper motives. So, Madam Speaker, I said... Um, do not bring me into the debate. Madam Speaker, I sit you are here, Madam Speaker. I, I sit here as Madam Speaker, not an attorney. Well, okay, Madam Speaker, you the presiding officer, Madam Speaker, and you interpret this and in order. So help me understand what's improper motive, Madam Speaker. I said that the first letter was a letter from the, US, from the St. Lucia Attorney General to the U.S. Department of Justice. In that letter, Madam Speaker, they made reference to two individuals. And I name the two individuals. Is that improper motive? All I am saying is that the letter named two individuals. I then went on to explain, Madam Speaker, that the US Department of Justice wrote, Madam Speaker, indicating that they believe, having assessed the dossier, that there was probable cause and there was a reason to accede to the request by St. Lucia. And that in itself. To say is to where the, the danger to is. To the request, that's improper motive. That is where the danger lies, Honourable Speaker. Honorable I Honorable. Where you, where, where you have then asserted, Madam yes, Speaker. You, Madam have, Speaker. Sorry. you have then asserted that the letter then says that there is probable cause. Madam Speaker, the letter says that. But Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker, Madam on Speaker, point Speaker of okay, order. let's move on, Madam Speaker. Madam let's Speaker, on a point of order. Point of order 41, standing order 41. Madam Speaker, I have sat here 
for a very long time, listening to the member for Kashmir South argue on the ruling of the Speaker of the House. Yes. When clearly, yes. standing out of 41 states, yes. the that there should be no appeal or review on the ruling of the, of, the, of the Speaker of the House. And it happens time and time again, and it goes on and on. Yes. The, the member needs to know his place. He is not the presiding officer in the House. Thank you, Honorable Minister. And um, my mic is on. And I will again say, herein lies my difficulty. And you're, I'm here, the members here make it very challenging, my, my job, extremely challenging more challenging than it's supposed to be. I rule on something, it is challenged. Another member picks it up, another one picks it up, another one picks it up. So from now, I will, I will choose to ignore and say that I have rule, let us move on. Once I've said that, it is final. Now, now honorable, now, honorable member for Castro South, I will repeat that your very words and you're reading a document that no one has access to, and, and I started off by saying the veracity of that document cannot be substantiated. And you're reading, and you continue to read, and now you've said you, you're up to three letters now and a court case. You said something about, unless you said something about a Florida court. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, if all due respect, Madam Speaker, and I've been very, Madam Speaker, if all due respect, I did not say there was a court. I want to hear the clarification on that because uh, unless I'm hearing wrongly, there was something said about a Florida court. Ma Madam Speaker, there's a difference between saying there is something said about the Florida court and I'm saying that there is a court case. I said, Madam Speaker, there was a letter written to the court in um, South Florida to appoint a commissioner to gather the evidence. I did not say there was a court case lodged against the honorable member, but Madam Speaker, let's make life easy. Can I move on? And you rule. If you rule to strike it out from answered, that's fine, Madam Speaker. Yes. Because Madam Speaker, we live in an we age of technology. I always remember that. But Madam Speaker, you rule and I'll respect your rule. I so remember, I so remember we live in an age of technology. I will say, that the member has made a point that you're imputing improper motives and let that be struck off the records. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm not the one who does the striking out. So um, honorable strike. member, please take your seat. Thank you. Some time ago, I intimated here that I will abide strictly by rules regarding cell phones ringing in this chamber. Can members recall that? Now, if at the time, members of the upper house were not in the chamber, that is too bad. And I continue to hear the sucking of teeth, honorable senator. And I, I will ask you to leave the chamber. And every time a phone, a cell phone since my ruling has rung in this house, it is by a stranger of the Honorable House of Assembly at the time. And it has come from these two corners. It has come from these two corners and not from members on the floor. So I take strong objection to the sucking of your teeth because I've asked for your phone. Honorable Member for Castro South, please proceed. So, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, we took a long time to get here, Madam Speaker. So, uh, so Madam Speaker. You were supposed to end at 18 minutes past nine. We will add 20 minutes onto that clock. 
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, let me say you've been very unfair to me, Madam Speaker, in this presentation. First of all, Madam Speaker, Madam, um, Honorable Members, I have a right as an elected member to express my views. I am not challenging you, Madam Speaker. I am expressing the opinion, Madam Speaker, for you to have described my presentation has been entirely centered on the urban member. It's not entirely correct. I have cited the contents of the bill. I have spoken about the PPP model. And one aspect of it had to relate to the previous experience that we had. So, Madam Speaker, for, I feel it's been a little unfair to describe my presentation as Madam Speaker, that on a point of, of order, once Madam, again, Madam, Madam, Speaker, Speaker, Madam Speaker, on a point of order. Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker, so point of order 41. There's no okay. point of order 41, I, I, I Madam Speaker. For the you all want to take over the house or what? The standing orders, no. Madam Speaker. Stand yeah. When I stand on a point of order, you shut up. Yes. No, that is that um, that is unparliamentary, honourable mem uh, minister. Yes, madam speaker, my apologies. I, I I just wanted to point out to the member for Castries East and Castries South that when a member stands on a point of order, that they keep quiet. That's right. Yes, keep quiet. Madam speaker, that's, that's a point of order 41, standing order 41. I would like to read for the benefit of the member of Castries South, madam speaker that the Speaker in the House and Chairman in a committee shall be responsible for the observance of the rules of order of the House and committee respectively, and their decision upon any point of order shall not be open to appeal and shall not be reviewed by the House. Madam Speaker, again and again, the member keeps questioning your rulings, and he's telling you that your ruling is unfair. That is out of order. And, he sh and you should ask him to desist from doing so. Honorable member for Castry South, it, what the honorable minister said is very correct. Um, I, I don't know whether you do it deliberately or whether you're not even aware that you do it, but it's almost constant. And I would ask that you desist from doing so. The fact that when I make a ruling, you are not pleased with it, and you stand up and say that you're not pleased with it. That in itself is out of order, okay? I am letting you know. Can we please proceed? <laughs> Madam Speaker, I can still afford to laugh and see the lighter side of such, Madam Speaker, you know, but it will not deter me, Madam Speaker. It will not deter me from making the point that I have to make, Madam Speaker. And even if I am told to shut up and know my place, Madam Speaker, I will still speak in this house, Madam Speaker, because the people of St. Lucia want us to ask those questions. And we will not shy from it, Madam Speaker. And if I say I feel that I'm treated unfair, that that means something so wrong, Madam Speaker, I apologize to you if I offended you, Madam Speaker, but I know you've had a long day, Madam Speaker. I know you've had a long day, but it's going to get even longer, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, I was making the point about the previous experience with the airport development, Madam Speaker, and all the allegations that were made about that previous experience, Madam Speaker. And I made reference to what a particular talk show host had said, Madam Speaker. And I ask the simple question, Madam Speaker, is it right for us to abandon the PPP model? Is it right for us to abandon a reputable agency like the World Bank and the IFC? Is it right for us to abandon an ab arrangement where we did not have to borrow 150 million US dollars, Madam Speaker, and instead we would earn revenue? And is it right for us to abandon all of that and for us to go back in an arrangement where we're borrowing $150 million? And I asked that question, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, I had made the point that the previous experience was tainted, Madam Speaker. It was tainted. And Madam Speaker, I'm asking the question, a more important question. If the, pre the previous experience was tainted, if the compelling logic was that we should not abandon what was in the best interest of St. Lucia, Madam Speaker. Sorry, Madam Speaker. 